So to, to start talking about sort of the history of the classical school, we got to go all the way back to the demonic era. So we're talking early Middle Ages, 1200s to 1400s. Um, so at this time, people who were evil were sort of seen as um, manifesting original sin, a fall from grace, um, things like that. So what's the solution to that? Well, burning at the stake. Um, which, of course, persisted through the late 1500s um, when we look at the um, the witch trials and everything like that. But um, this, this early Middle Ages had a lot of superstition. And basically, if somebody was committing acts of not just, I mean, not obviously not just any crime, but like we're talking about like if somebody's murdering somebody else, if, if you know, rape, robbery, like the injuring and or you know severely injuring somebody else like those types of things um it was basically saying well if you're doing that it means that you are possessed and so this kind of came from a very a very dichotomous view of good versus evil and so um there were a range of interpretations of evil from you know the cosmic level so things like oh well it's karma or it's fate uh, things like that to personal deviance resulting from demonic possession and so there's and and a lot of things that fell kind of anywhere in between there and so this was used to not only explain criminal behavior but also victimization and so if you were if, you, if something happened to you, then it's, you know, especially if there's like this idea of karma or fate, um, well, then, you know, you did something to deserve that. Hopefully, you know what this, um, this is a still shot from The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Um, amazing movie, by the way. Um, but it, it, it's that, that idea that, it, that the, the only way we can explain, you know, these types of things that are horrible that we don't want to think about, you know, um, either abusing kids or being abused, like things like that. It's, well, the only way we can explain it is demonic possession and, um, or some kind of other major superstition that is based in um, religion of some kind, typically. Um, but that would be the demonic era is all about good versus evil. And then the Enlightenment happened. And so this is also known as the Age of Reason. So we're talking 1600s, 1700s here. And so this was a very intellectual movement. And so this began with the English Revolution and ended with the French Revolution, actually. Um, but this is where you had the first real philosophers, at least in terms of they were you know, writing things down and um, you know, disseminating that information. You had political reformers you know, blow up in this at this time. There was so many, much reform going on, social reform, political reform. You had social theorists. You had um, religious skeptics for like the first time. They were they were openly skeptical about various different religions. And um, so this is kind of the age where it became about science, it became about intellect, it became about philosophy, as opposed to just, you know, demonic era, good versus evil, everything heavily based in religion. Um, and I, I, this is very cute. Nothing yet. How about you, Newton? And of course, Newton is the one who got the apple that hit him on the head to and to, to come up with the uh, the idea of what gravity is. Um, but that was part of the Enlightenment. Was like all of these big thinkers that we think about is that was the Enlightenment, that age of reason. And so the Enlightenment also brought people like Thomas Hobbes. And so Thomas Hobbes was uh, his big thing. He was known for was the social contract. And the social contract is essentially this, this contract, which is not a physical contract. It is, it's a, it's a metaphorical concept, but it's this idea that um, it's, there's this contract between people and the state. And so people are naturally self-serving. That's a natural human trait, but we will agree to give up some of our selfish interests, as long as everybody else does, for the good of the state. And that was what Hobbes called the contract, the social contract. And so basically that means the state is then empowered to use force of some kind or another against anybody who breaches that contract. So basically we're like, well, I mean, I want to do whatever I want, but I mean, as a society, we don't want, you know, everybody raping and pillaging and taking whatever they want. And I don't want my stuff getting stolen and I don't want to get hurt and I don't want to. So, well, okay. So to make it so that all these things that we can agree that we generally don't want to have happen, at least to us, I promise not to do those things if you promise not to do those things. And that's the social contract is, we, is then we basically say, 
as a society, we all need to not do these things, but somebody needs to hold those accountable who break these rules that we're putting into place. And so the social contract is saying that we have these rules and that the government gets to basically help help enforce those rules. And then um, Hobbes also wrote The Leviathan, which um, he described the structure of society. He described what legitimate government should be. Um, and then, of course, this was also the first time he put forward the idea of the social contract. And then John Locke was also a major thinker in the Enlightenment period. Um, he was well known for his concept of tabula rasa, which literally is blank slate is what that means. And essentially this means that he said that individuals are born without any built-in mental content. We are morally neutral, essentially. And that all of our knowledge comes from our experience, it comes from our perception, comes from what our, what's taught to us as children, things like that. And so one of his big things is that he said that children are free and rational beings. So they haven't yet been, you know, taught to think a certain way or, um, or what have you. So because everyone is born with this ability to become autonomous and to be, you know, to freely follow their own internal moral compass. So this, th this realization is that these, these crucial human qualities are often thwarted by you know, things like the imposition of prejudice, um, that which then, of course, perpetuates as oppression and further superstition. Uh, and so when you have the older generation that imposes these, like, unquestioned beliefs and and the, their ways on the youth of their generation, then that outcome is, according to John Locke, it's bondage as opposed to that actualization of freedom, which we are all capable of doing, but we are basically limited by people in our childhood, by the people telling us what we need to, how we need to think and what we need to do. And so obviously this is very heavy on the nurture side of the nature nurture debate because John Locke basically said nothing, nothing is inherent. There's, there's no, no nature part of it. It's all nurture. And because we are born blank slates and we learn everything. But um, he was very much about, you know, how we, we, we should not be imposing our beliefs and our, our ways of life upon children because all that does is limit their ability to for this, you know, this to achieve this self-actualization and of what freedom really is. <clears throat> so the classical school then developed from the Enlightenment. And um, the classical school, essentially the major underpinning of the classical school is this idea of free will. So people have free will and we always make choices. We're making choices constantly. People make choices based on what we think the rewards will be and what we think the punishments will be. And so this relates to crime and criminal behavior because crime promises a payoff. People wouldn't commit crime if there wasn't a payoff of, of some kind. This could be a monetary payoff. It could be um, some kind of, you know, getting something, some kind of physical thing, but it could also be, you know, sex as a payoff. So that would justify certain types of, um, of sexual assaults and things like that in terms of the underlying motivation for those things. It's the payoff, um, you know, getting to, to get my anger out on somebody could be a payoff. And so, you know, that could, that would be the underpinnings of certain types of assault. Um, uh, um, murder certainly has lots of payoffs or otherwise people wouldn't do it, whether it's getting rid of somebody who's a problem or getting something from it or whatever. There is a motivation there. There's a payoff of some kind. Otherwise people wouldn't commit crimes. So that, and it comes from this idea of free will is that it's a decision. So every time somebody commits a crime, it is a decision and it's, that decision is based on the perceived rewards for that crime and the likelihood of the perceived punishments, which is probably low or else somebody wouldn't commit a crime. If they think they're going to be punished, then they're probably not going to commit that crime. So then from this classical school perspective, crime and deviance then are seen as the products of the exercise of free will. So when we, we have this free will, then one way we use that is through crime and deviance. We make that decision. We make that choice. And of course, deviance violates the social contract. And so that is one sort of, we can bring it back to, to Hobbes' contract. And so if we're, if deviance violates that social contract, then that justifies or is remedied by punishment and deterrence. So we want to punish those who violate the social contract and we want to deter people who may be thinking about doing it to maybe not. And this can be done through, um, general deterrence, which is basically where we're trying to make it so nobody 
nobody's going to want to make this decision to commit this crime, that the punishment is just too much or too bad or whatever it might be. Um, or it could be specific deterrence. So if you have committed a crime or you have violated the social contract in a specific way, we want to make it as a society, we want to make it so that you don't want to do that, commit, commit that crime again, or maybe even any crime, but you specifically, we're not going to commit another crime, which would be specific deterrence. But either one of those combines to sort of this idea that we, if somebody violates a social contract, we don't want that. And so we need to either punish um, or deter or some combination of the two. So a major thinker um, as part of the um, the classical school would be is Cesar Vicaria. And there's what he looks like. He's quite the looker. Um, so Cesar Vicaria basically said that people choose all behavior and crime is one of those decisions. And choices are designed to bring pleasure, reduce pain, so maximize benefits, reduce costs. And we can control crime then with the fear of punishment because we want to make it so that this pain part is there's at least a higher likelihood or that it's going to be really bad if it happens um, or some combination of that. So he actually said, Cesar Beccaria said that the punishment, in order to be effective, it has to be severe. So that means it has to be bad enough that it's going to have a deterrent effect. It has to be certain, meaning that people know that if they commit a certain crime, there's a high likelihood they're going to be punished for it. And it needs to be swift, where you can't you can't delay a punishment because then it won't be connected to the crime in the first place, either in the minds of the person who, who actually committed that crime or in the minds of general society. So in order for punishment to be effective, then it has to be severe enough. So a punishment that's bad enough to be to outweigh any of the good that comes from that crime. And it has to be certain and it has to be swift. Otherwise, it's not effective. But he also was a major proponent that the punishment has to fit the crime because so it has to be proportional to the seriousness of the crime, because otherwise people are going to commit more serious offenses to basically try to, like, get away with the crime. Because if it's like, oh, well, if I break into this house and I and I get caught, I get the same punishment as for like murder. So I may as well kill any potential witnesses because I'm going to get the same I'm going to get the same punishment either way. So that's marginal deterrence. And Cesar Beccaria recognized that. And he, and he said, well, it has to be proportional to the crime. Um, but for sort of to avoid marginal deterrence, but also just for general um, ethical and moral principles. So he was actually um, a major proponent that torture is unfair and torture is ineffective. Um, he said that if you get a confession from torture, it's it, the confession may have nothing to do with innocence or guilt. Um, because people confess under torture all the time, regardless of their actual guilt. And so that means if you're innocent, then you're getting tortured anyways, which is a punishment in and of itself. And if you're guilty, you actually get tortured twice because you're going to get tortured for the information and then you're going to receive your punishment. So that's why Cesar Beccaria is like, that's unfair and ineffective. So we should not be torturing people. And he actually also thought at the time that current punishments were excessive and um, could, were not morally justifiable. And specifically, he was um, he talked in uh, an opposition to the death penalty because he said, well, people gave up their rights to join society. So going back to the social contract, but nobody would agree that the state should be able to kill them. People aren't going to agree to that. So that's not something we should be able to impose on people for having breached that social contract. And um, he was actually one of the first people to also talk about education as a prevention method. And he and he talked about this, well, we need to be preventing crime as opposed to just punishing when it happens. So he was one of the first people to really talk about prevention and, and the need for it. And then Jeremy Bentham um, was actually one of his students, was one of Cesar Beccaria's students. And so he was very much in line with um, had very similar types of thinking. And so he said human behavior, result of rational thought, people are rational, people, rational people then weigh pleasure against pain. And um, so this was the, the hedonistic calculus is what he called it. And it's this, this weighing of costs and benefits. And so it's something that people naturally do. And this is a natural human thing. And so this hedonistic calculus is something that we all engage in for any decision that we make is that we weigh the costs and benefits. And if the benefits outweigh the costs, we're going to make that decision. And he said, every person is like that. Even the people that we think aren't rational are rational in the sense that they do engage in this hedonistic calculus. 
So something else that Jeremy Bentham talked about was utilitarianism. And so this is basically the idea that um, we evaluate laws and, and you know behaviors by how much pleasure or pain they bring. So if a law makes a lot of people unhappy, it's a bad law. And if a law gives a lot of people happiness or they're, they're happy with the result, then it's a good law. And so he was very much focused on the happiness and well-being of the population. And therefore, he believed that punishment in the form of the infliction of pain should always be justified in terms of the greater good. So it shouldn't just be that we are, um, you know, doling out punishment just for the sake of punishment. There should actually be a larger, greater good that comes from it, or else we shouldn't be doing it at all. Um, interestingly, this is the actual stuffed Bentham. Um, it's his actual body preserved at the University College London um, since they acquired it in 1850. It's uh, his head, though, is actually made of wax because they actually destroyed his head when he, they attempted the mummification process. Um, but it is actually still nearby for people to see. Um, it, it's because uh, you can see like his skull or something in, a, in another area. But the body is his actual skeleton stuffed with hay in some of um, Bentham's actual clothing. So that's interesting. So now you know who Jeremy Bentham is. And so that would be interesting if you ever went to the University of College London because they have the actual Jeremy Bentham there. Um, so something else that Bentham is well known for is the Panopticon. And um, so Panopticon literally translates to observe all. But essentially what it is, it's this idea uh, that Bentham came up with for prison design. And so this is kind of what um, the design looks like where um, you have so, so you have like a single watchman um, in the middle and then you have all the inmates around the watchman. And so this is what it looks like. Here's an actual one, um, a picture of one using this design. So the watchman, the guards are in this middle tower and all of the inmates are in cells in basically a big circle around the guard tower. So it basically allows a single watchman to observe all the inmates um, of an institution without the inmates being able to tell whether or not they're being watched. And that's the key to the Panopticon is that they don't know if they're being watched. So it's impossible for any person in any cell um, to know whether or not they're being watched. But it's also impossible for the guard in the middle to actually be watching everybody at once. But as the prisoners in the cells, they don't know when they're being watched. So essentially they have to assume they're always being watched and behave accordingly. So this is sort of in direct opposition to the way that um, prisons are designed where you have you no know, big long hallways and then the guard kind of comes down the hallway to check on everybody. But then the, if the inmates know, they know when the guard is coming and they know when the guard is not there. And so if the guard is not there, then nobody can see what they're doing in their cell. And so that's when stuff happens. Um, and so in this kind of design, you, you have the, the inmates, they don't know if they're ever being watched at any given time. So, cause you can't predict where the guard's going to be looking. Um, so the chance of being seen is always there. And so, um, the focus then is on the certainty of punishment, um, because violent or deviant behavior that's happening within a cell always has the chance of being caught at any time. And so... This is to the point where you, it's actually even um, theorized that you actually wouldn't even have to have anybody in that tower because if the inmates thought there was somebody in there who could be watching them, that would be enough to make them alter their behavior to behave as if they're being watched. And so that's kind of the beauty of the Panopticon is that in terms of using resources um, that are scarce, it makes it so that you you have a really good use of those resources by only needing a couple of guards in this middle tower to be able to successfully watch over all of the inmates um, within their view. So um, this design has also been used in the community um, where it's any time where you have sort of the few watching the many in things like security cameras, because um, you never know when they're looking at you, especially if you, know, in, you go into a department store and they have that black sort of case over it so you don't know where it's pointing. You basically have to behave as if it's pointed at you because it could be and you don't know when it's pointed at you and when it isn't. So that's that same idea of, you, of it can't possibly be looking everywhere at once, but you have to behave as if it's looking at you because it could be. And that's sort of the key to this design.